All right, welcome back for our next lesson on economic geography. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking at the question of industrial location. So just to give you an overview of what we're doing here, we're in this lesson looking at the idea of modeling economic processes and uh, looking at industrial location as kind of our, our case study of that. And we're going to then go through a series of well-known models of industrial location. So starting with the von Thunen model about the arrangement of economic activities around a market center. Look at the hoteling model, which is a one-dimensional spatial model. Then we'll look at the Weber model, which is a two-dimensional model based on some of the same principles. Then we'll look at the Kristaller model, uh, also known as central place theory and finish up by looking at the concept of an urban hierarchy. So let's get started and talk about what is industrial location. It's basically the question of why do certain industries locate in certain places? So it's not just random what kind of economic activities are happening in what areas and the industrial location question is about figuring out why certain things are being done in certain places. And in looking at this, we're going to kind of take this opportunity to explore the way that economic modeling is done within what's called the classical or neoclassical approach to economics. And so if you were to take an economics class in the economics department, you know, intro to microeconomics, intro to macroeconomics, this is kind of the, the tradition that you'd be working within. And in those classes, you wouldn't really be doing the geography parts so much. You know, you'd be doing economics without geographical space for the most part. And so when you take that tradition of economics and add the geography to it, you get some of the models that we're going to be looking at in this lesson that try to specify spatial processes, right? things happening across geography that uh, influence the locations of things using the same approaches that you would use in non-spatial uh, economics. And so I've got some of these uh, premises laid out here in the, the sub bullets here. So the first one, and this is a, a very important concept when we're talking about economics, in particular economics as a discipline. Right? So the uh, academic discipline that studies economics, um, one of the core principles that so much economics uh, research and theory and so forth is based on is what's called homo economicus. So this is kind of a, a fake scientific uh, species name uh, that refers to the idea that people are conceived of within these classical and neoclassical models as rational utility maximizers. So what that means is, so start with the utility maximizing part. So utility uh, is a term that's used to mean things that people want. So your utility is the uh, things that make you happy, that you want to have, that increase your well-being, uh, and you lose utility if you don't get those things. Right? So it's all the all the stuff that you want or that's good for you uh, makes up your utility. And so the homo economicus idea is that we can imagine people as trying to rationally maximize the amount of utility they have. So you're going to try to do whatever is going to be the best at getting the most good for yourself. And you're going to pursue that as rationally as possible. Now, we know that this isn't actually how people work, right? People are not totally rational in all their decisions that they make. They don't actually uh, just pursue their own individual utility. But the idea here is that we're close enough that in the aggregate, people tend towards trying to maximize their utility in the best way that they can. And so by making the simplification of treating everybody as fully rational and 
only focused on maximizing their own utility that we can much more easily build models. And those models will get close enough to reality to be worth the cost of that simplification of how people like actually uh, work. So that's kind of a, a core idea here. Homo economicus, that people are treated as rational utility maximizers within these models. Then we're also making models that are going after an efficient outcome from market-based interactions. So these are market-based models uh, at their core. So if you think back to our last lesson, we talked about there are different ways of organizing economic activity. These models are really focused on how market interactions work. So there, there's no centralized planner deciding how this is all going to work, but rather each individual trying to maximize their utility within a market context where they're making exchanges with other people People when both people think that they gain something from it. The idea is that if you let those interactions go on, eventually that market will reach an efficient outcome. And so by efficient, we mean there's no more opportunities for someone to come in and find some way to make a profit by taking advantage of the fact that other people haven't, uh, haven't found the optimal way to do things. So Eventually, again, this is the, the simplifying assumption that lies behind these models, is that eventually all opportunities to find a profit would be found by somebody. Somebody's going to notice that, oh, I can make profit by doing this thing differently, and they're going to do it. And that is going to uh, make the overall outcome maximally efficient. And so we can use our model to just look at what is this efficient outcome that we're eventually going to get to. And it might take some, in reality, might take a little time to get there. People might not quite realize what the most rational thing to do is right off the bat. But if you let it go for a little while, because everybody's trying to maximize their utility in the most rational way possible, eventually we'll reach this efficient outcome where there's no more opportunities to do things better. Uh, and that's what the, the model is telling us about. And so this brings us to another phrase that you may have heard. Uh, it's a very well-known description of how market-based economies are supposed to work, which is the idea of the invisible hand. So this comes from uh, a economist from the 1700s named Adam Smith, who was one of the first people to really analyze the workings of a market-based economy in detail. And he concluded that when you let all these individuals, right, so we're talking about a market-based economy, there's no central organization, nobody is looking at this and saying, here's how it's going to work, right? Each individual within this market is just trying to do their own thing for themselves. They're trying to maximize their own personal utility. They don't care about everybody else's utility. They're not worried about whether the system as a whole is functional. But Smith argued that the interactions that happen within the market will eventually produce the best outcome, even without somebody looking down on this from kind of a, a central uh, role in organizing it. So the market produces outcomes that are as if there was an invisible hand putting them together to be maximally efficient. So the uh, invisible hand is the idea that the market will produce these optimal outcomes without anybody overseeing it or anybody trying to make it produce optimal outcomes. So that'll, that'll just happen. It'll grow out of all these interactions among people. So those three assumptions are common throughout classical and neoclassical economics. Right? They, these models work on the idea of the homo economicus, of seeking this efficient market outcome, and of the idea that there's this idea, the invisible hand that markets are going to produce optimal outcomes even without anybody overseeing them. When we bring these modeling approaches into the geographical context, we try to add a geographical space as a dimension of our economy. Another very common uh, assumption that gets put into these models is what's called the isotropic plane. So what that means is that geographical space is just a set of xy coordinates and everything is the same everywhere within this space. And that's our starting assumption and we only add differences in space into our model when we need them or when they're the point of the model. 
that ideally we're going to start by building these models that happen on this featureless surface where everything is exactly the same everywhere and see what kind of patterns arise out of the economic interactions among people. So we're not starting from the messy reality of real space that has mountains and rivers and political borders and all kinds of other stuff in it. We're starting from this featureless uh, plane that's exactly the same everywhere. So we can get this really abstract model and then we can see in what ways does reality, with all its weirdness and unevenness of space, in what ways does reality distort our idealized models that work on the isotropic plane? So the isotropic plane is this, is added to these assumptions in order to start working in two dimensions and, and making our economy geographical. And the last bullet point that I've got there is that these are quantitative models. So Economics as a whole is one of the most quantitative of the social sciences, and so there's a lot of math that goes into building these models. If you're not a, a big math person, count yourself lucky that you're taking this course with me because I am a cultural geographer by training, and I don't do a lot of math in the research that I do, and I don't think that being able to do the math of these models is necessarily the most important thing that I want you to learn from this class. So we are going to dial the math way down. All right, we're going to look at conceptually what happens when we apply these different models, but we're not going to get into trying to actually calculate the exact uh, numbers and, and outcomes and so forth of things. So if you're not a big math person, you know, count yourself lucky to be taking this course with me and with this approach. If you are a big math person and you want to be able to actually get the equations and plug the numbers into it and so forth, then uh, I would encourage you to look into taking Dr. Hartman's environmental modeling class. She is a math person and will give you all the mathematical modeling that uh, you might want. So just to, you know, give you a uh, a sense of the approach that we're going to take here. I want you to understand conceptually what these models are doing. I'm not going to worry about if you could actually plug numbers into them and make calculations of, of things. So as I said, this is what we've been talking about is this classical or neoclassical approach to economics. And it's the dominant one within economics as a discipline. It's not necessarily the dominant one within economic geography because the discipline of geography is a very mixed discipline. We have people with all kinds of different approaches to research and to theory and so forth. And so there are some economic geographers that take this uh, classical or neoclassical approach to things. There's lots of other geographers that don't take this kind of approach. And so I want to kind of uh, flag for you that there are alternative economics theories that don't use the same set of starting assumptions that say, no, it actually really matters that people aren't rational utility maximizers and that markets don't settle on an efficient outcome if given a little bit of time to work things out and that those actually matter enough that these classical and neoclassical models aren't actually helpful at seeing the most important things about uh, economic geography or about economics more more broadly. So in this lesson, we're going to be focusing on these classical and neoclassical kinds of models to help you understand this approach to economic geography. And because this is kind of some of the, the earliest or foundational economic geography work that's been done. But then as we get into our other lessons later in our course, then we're going to be moving away from these kinds of models and looking at other approaches to thinking about economic geography. So let's start with the first of these models that I want to talk about, which is called the von Thunen model after Johann Heinrich von Thunen, who developed it. So he was a, a German economist and he was interested in the arrangement of economic activities around some sort of a market center. So you can imagine that as being like, you know, a, a town. Right. And so in the town is where people come to do their business. And that's where people uh, trade and sell, sell and buy stuff. But then in the area around 
that market center in what we can call the hinterland of that market center we have all of the productive activities going on people are producing all the things that they will then come into town to buy and sell to each other and von thunen proposed that these activities are going to be arranged this in a similar way around each market center. So each town is going to have the same set of essentially rings around it of different kinds of economic activities. And the illustration there is the sort of the classic illustration of the von Thunen model. This is the set of rings that von Thunen identified in looking at towns on the plains of northern Germany. So this is an area where, you know, you can kind of imagine that isotropic plane assumption coming closer to reality, right? There's no big mountain ranges disrupting things and so forth. So it's, you know, not taking you as, as far away from reality to assume that this is this isotropic plane, that all the land is exactly the same wherever you are, right? So we're not looking at oh well you're going to grow this thing here and that thing there because the soil is good for one crop here and the soil is good for a different crop there von thunen is saying even if we have the the land is exactly the same has the same soil quality the same uh, topography everything everywhere around our town we're still going to get this arrangement of different economic activities happening at different distances from our market center and so he described this as a bid rent model. Uh, let me move my face out of the way of the explanation of that there. So the basic idea behind this is that these economic activities are arranged based on how much the people doing each of these activities are willing and able to pay for that land. So our land is in a market. So we have a, a market system. Land is a commodity that can be bought and sold in the market. You want to do some sort of economic activity, you got to buy some land for it. And so that the most desirable land is the land closest to our market center because right? that minimizes your transportation costs of bringing your goods that you're producing into the market to sell them to somebody else. And so everybody, all else being equal, would prefer to be as close to the market center as possible. But there's only so much land there. And so you have multiple people wanting it, and so they essentially bid on that land. Right? So if you are the owner of the piece of land near that market center, you're going to sell it to the person that's going to give you the most money for it. And one person's going to give you, uh, you know, two hundred dollars for it, and somebody else is going to give you four hundred dollars for it. You sell it to the four hundred dollar person, and if you sell it to that four hundred dollar person, then somebody else comes along willing to pay eight hundred dollars for it. Then, if that four hundred dollar uh, buyer is rational utility maximizer, right? They are trying to get the most benefit for themselves that they can. They're probably going to say, "Oh, hey, I can, you know, make back my investment plus." double it if I sell it to this person that's willing to pay 800 so I'm going to sell it to them and then I'll go buy you know perhaps twice as much land somewhere farther out where the uh, price is lower so whoever is willing and able to pay the most money for a piece of land is going to get it prices of land are highest closer to the market center because it minimizes those transportation costs and so this arrangement of economic activities around this market center is based on how much people doing these different kinds of activities are uh, going to be able to pay for that land. And so we can really see that clearly if we compare the innermost and outermost uh, rings there. So the innermost is vegetable and dairy production. So these are things that produce a lot of value from small areas of land. So if you have a vegetable farm, for example, uh, you're growing a lot of high value crops and so you're getting a lot of dollars per acre. So you're going to be willing to purchase this high cost land close to the market center because you're going to make a lot of money off of each acre that you have there. So you only need to buy a small amount of land in order to make enough money to support yourself. You only need a small amount of land. So you're willing to pay a lot for those acres. 
and then that will really cut down your transportation costs, which for vegetables are going to be pretty high because vegetables are you know, big and heavy. Uh, and if you'll notice the dates that uh, Johann Heinrich von Thunen lived, this is before the invention of refrigeration. So you need to get those vegetables to market very quickly in order to be able to sell them before they spoiled. Uh, you couldn't just put them in a refrigerated truck and drive them. And so this incidentally is why uh, the nickname of New Jersey is the Garden State. Uh, and you know people sometimes laugh at that because New Jersey's reputation is sort of the opposite of being a garden these days. But early on, you have New York City, you have this big population center, lots of people there wanting to, you know, eat a little bit of vegetables. Where are they going to get them from? Well, they can't, couldn't get them from California, where you'd get a lot of your vegetables from today, because back in, you know, the 1700s, the 1800s, uh, you couldn't ship vegetables that far. You didn't have refrigerated trucks and stuff like that. So instead, they would get their vegetables from the areas immediately surrounding New York City, which included northern New Jersey. Uh, so to people in New York, New Jersey was the garden state, where all the gardens were that produced their uh, their vegetables. And so this was the von Thunen model in practice, that those uh, areas in northern New Jersey that were really close to New York City. The, it's a very desirable land because it's close to the city, close to your customers that you'd be taking whatever you produce to, and the vegetable farmers were willing and able to pay the most for that land. And you compare it to the, that outermost ring, which is ranching. Ranching takes a huge amount of land. Okay? You have very few cows per acre, and therefore a much lower uh, amount of money you're generating per acre when you're ranching because you just need a lot of land for your cows. So you can't afford to buy that highest value land closest to the market center. You know, if somehow you got that land, that'd be great uh, because you wouldn't have very far to go with your stuff to market. But you need a lot of land, so you can't afford to pay very much for any one acre of the land. You're not going to make a lot of money off of an individual acre. So the ranchers get pushed all the way out to that outermost ring where the uh, the land prices are low because nobody else really wants to be out there uh, because it's so far from your market center. But the ranchers can, can go out there because they need the cheap land to spread out and have their cows. And because their transportation costs aren't as big of an issue because they could, the, the cows could walk into the market center. Right? The, the butcher was in that market center. And so you walk your cows in on their own four feet. And so the transportation costs aren't as big an issue for you as they are for, say, the vegetable farmer. So this specific set of rings that we've got here, you know, starting with vegetables close to the city, then firewood, then field crops, which means basically grains like wheat, and then ranching uh, the farthest out. We don't see this in modern cities because the factors that apply to this, um, to you know, what activities need uh, that highest priced land closest to the city aren't the same as they were in, you know, the year 1800 or so. Uh, but the basic premise underlying it, this bid rent model, the idea that land will end up going to the use that the person can afford to buy the highest priced land for, and then lower value land uses will get pushed farther out away from uh, your population centers, that still applies. And you can easily see that for something like housing prices. So the most expensive housing is usually the housing that's closest to the city, and then it gets cheaper as you move farther out. And so in some places, you're seeing people getting pushed to you know two and three hour commutes because they can't afford to live closer to the city. I'll be mentioning a little later in the lesson, my hometown of Palmerton, Pennsylvania, in the eastern part of the state, there are people who live in Palmerton and commute into New York City, which is like a, a two, two and a half hour commute, something like that, every day, because the housing prices in Palmerton are so much cheaper than living in New York City or in the immediate suburbs of New York City, and people decided that it was worth it to have that long commute if it meant they got to buy a nicer and bigger house uh, than they could get closer to the city. 
So the basic idea behind the von Thuner model, this bid rent model, is still applies even though the specific uh, activities in the specific rings there aren't the same as they were back in the early 1800s. So now we'll move on to the hoteling model. So the hoteling model, developed by Harold Hoteling, answers the question of given the locations of your customers. So if you've got customers distributed across space, you're trying to locate your business in a way that will minimize the travel cost of those customers. That that's the best place to put your business is the place that's going to minimize your customers' travel cost because that will make it most likely that they are going to come do business with you. And if your travel cost is too, too big, you start losing customers or they start being less willing to pay a lot for whatever you're offering because they uh, because they're paying so much for their travel costs to get to you uh, that they uh, you know they can't it's, it isn't worth it to them to pay more for stuff once they finally get there so you want to minimize that travel cost and so the hoteling model I mentioned earlier is a one-dimensional model so hoteling simplified geographical space into a single dimension and so the kind of uh, story that he attached to this model to kind of explain um, you know, to give us a mental image of what's going on here is he said, imagine that you've got a beach with people all along the beach. So I've drawn that in the PowerPoint. Uh, the beach is just this sort of line and then the people are all those dots aligned, right? You've got a beach, you've got people scattered all up and down the beach. Right? And people tend to distribute themselves kind of evenly along a beach because you want to kind of get away from everybody else and have your own little patch of a beach to sit on. I right, see so you've got this beach with your customers spread along it and you are an ice cream vendor and you've got a, a little ice cream truck so you can go anywhere on this beach. All right, you're not tied down to a, a building uh, where your ice cream shop is. You can move, put your ice cream truck wherever you want along this beach to try to sell your ice cream to people. So where are you going to try to go along this beach? Well, the obvious place to go is right in the middle. And that's going to minimize the travel cost of all those people coming in to uh, buy your ice cream. Right, so the, if you located off to one side, that would increase the, the travel costs of the people to the other side. And so some of them might decide oh, it's not worth it going all the way over there to get ice cream. Or if I have to go all the way over there to get ice cream, I'm not willing to pay a lot for it. Right? You got to balance out the fact that I trudged all the way over here by giving me cheaper ice cream. And you as the ice cream seller, of course, would like to charge more for your ice cream because then you make more money off of it. So if you are one ice cream seller, you're going to stick yourself in the middle of the beach there. If you are, if there are two ice cream sellers, they are both going to try to go to the middle of that beach. And so, you know, they can't obviously be in the exact same spot on top of each other. So one will be slightly to one side, one slightly to the other side, and they'll each get half of the customers. Right, so you have, people will go to whichever ice cream shop they can get to most easily. We're assuming for the sake of this model that the the shops are selling basically the same things, right? One isn't like better ice cream uh, than the other for the sake of simplicity. So you each kind of claim half uh the beach there and you're going to stay towards the middle even if there are two of you because if one of you shifts to the side then you split whatever's in between and so now you can see the green shop is actually getting additional customers right? they're getting their whole half of the beach plus half of whoever's in between the two shops so the shops are going to be drawn towards that central location. And so this basic idea is going to uh, come up in some of our other models as well, that uh, economic activity tends to go towards the center when we're on a kind of isotropic plane, right? This is the isotropic line, right? The customers are distributed equally across this line. There's no other things interfering along here. So in that situation, it's going to pull our economic activity towards the center. So hoteling 
was doing a one-dimensional model, you know, just this line. And so, you know, he used the example of the beach, which is basically a line to kind of uh, explain it. But most of our economic activity isn't happening in a, a one-dimensional space, it's happening in two-dimensional space. And we can go north, south, and east, west uh, in our economy. And so the simplest model to deal with this kind of situation is the Weber model. So developed by Alfred Weber, it's a two-dimensional model. And the idea here is that you don't just have customers like in the hoteling model. In the hoteling model, the ice cream vendors showed up at the beach with their ice cream already in hand, and their only question was where to locate in order to sell that ice cream to as many beachgoers as possible. Weber was looking at industries that have to worry about where their customers are, but also worry about where the inputs that they're getting are. So for any productive activity you, you might be doing, you're going to have some sort of inputs that you need to get. Then you're going to make your stuff out of that, and then you're going to have to take that to your customers who are buying it from you. So if we're talking about, for example, a steel factory, and so if, if our red star there is a steel factory, they need various inputs. So the two primary ones for steel manufacturing would be iron ore and coal. And those are the two biggest things that you need for a steel factory. And so all else being equal, it would be great to be located right next to the iron mine because then you have practically no transportation costs to move that iron from the mine to the factory. It would also be great, all else being equal, to be located right next to the coal mine. Because again, minimize transportation costs that you can mine that coal and put it directly into your steel factory without having to transport it over some distance between them. And then, of course, all else being equal, it would be great to locate your steel factory right next to your customers that are buying your steel. And so in this case, your customers buying the steel are probably other industries and the, uh, you know, car manufacturers and uh engineers that build bridges and you know whoever else is using steel. Right? It'd be great to be located right next to them because no transportation cost. And it's important to keep in mind when we talk about transportation costs that in a sense it doesn't matter who's directly paying the transportation costs. Right? You can't eliminate transportation costs just by having your person you're buying from or selling to literally pay the like railroad or trucks or whatever that are are transporting, right? You might say, oh, well, you know, we have to get that coal, but if the coal company pays to transport the coal, then it's no longer a transportation cost. But if the coal company has to pay to transport the coal, then they're going to want to make that up in the price of the coal. If the coal company has to uh, pay the shipping, they're going to be less willing to pay or to uh, give you as good of a deal on the coal. And so that's it's going to get paid for somewhere in there. And it doesn't really matter who actually writes the check to the railroad that's bringing your coal in, uh, because if the the coal mine uh, pays for the the shipping, then they're going to demand a higher price for the coal to make up for it. If the steel factory that's buying the coal pays for the shipping, then they're going to insist on a lower price for the coal to offset it. All right, so the transportation cost still is in there. It still matters, even if uh, even if the uh, you know depending on who actually literally writes the check. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're buying stuff online and you see free shipping. That shipping is still getting paid for by somebody, you know, uh, and so that's going to get reflected in prices of things. So you're still paying for shipping even if it's hidden in the prices of the things that uh, you're buying. So anyway, so you've got these transportation costs from all your different inputs and then in your transportation to your customers. And so what I've got up here is a very simplified version where we've got an industry that has two inputs, each being sourced from a single place and one location where their customers are located. In reality, of course, you might be getting inputs from multiple different places, sometimes the same input from multiple different places. You know, you get coal from several different mines. Uh, and your customers may be in several different locations. So there might be a lot more than just these three things, but three is enough to illustrate the concept of the model.
And as I said before, I just want you to understand the concepts of these models. You don't need to actually be able to you know, put numbers in and calculate them. So what Weber argues is that the location of an industry is going to depend on the balance of these transportation costs between their sources of inputs and the customers because different things have different transportation costs. Certain inputs might be very bulky and difficult to transport, so their transportation costs will be higher than, you know, would be higher per mile transportation cost than the transportation cost of some other input or than the transportation cost of the finished product. And that's so that's going to depend on things like the bulk and weight of the thing, you know, how much volume of this input do you need versus how much volume of that input do you need. And certain things may have special needs in transport, right? They may need a refrigerated vehicle and that's going to raise your transportation cost as compared to something that can be transported uh, just in a regular train car or truck. Uh, so all these different factors in terms of the, the cost of transportation. And so the location of your industry is going to get pulled towards whatever area, whatever uh, either input source or uh, customer location has the highest transportation costs. As you're going to try to reduce those transportation costs as much as you can by trading them off with you'll bring other stuff farther, but it's cheaper per mile, so you come out ahead. So in the little sketch that I've got on the screen there, we can see that the transportation cost of bringing the blue input to our factory is seems to be the highest because our factory is shifted towards that blue location. Now, the factory is not smack dab in the middle. It's tilted towards the blue, so that reduces the blue transportation cost at the price of increasing the green and yellow transportation costs. But if the blue is that much more costly, our factory is coming out ahead. Factory is not going all the way over to the blue because at some point the uh, the trade-off there isn't worth it. Right? And what you save by being closer to blue is more than offset by the extra cost of transporting the green and the yellow there. So uh, you kind of balance out at this uh, particular location. So to give you a real world example so that you can kind of see how this works out, I mentioned before my hometown is the town of Palmerton in eastern Pennsylvania. And Palmerton was built around a zinc uh, smelting plant. So that was, that was Palmerton's big industry was zinc production. And the town was built as a company town by the New Jersey Zinc Company. So the New Jersey Zinc Company, as you can guess from the name, was mining zinc in New Jersey. And so that is the blue triangle there that is the, the input of zinc ore being mined in New Jersey. So the New Jersey Zinc Company wanted to locate a um, plant to refine and smelt that zinc. Uh, to turn it into the kinds of products that they could then sell because you can't just sell raw zinc ore uh, to anybody. So they needed to locate this factory and so they went looking where's the best place we can build this factory and then kind of build a town around it for all of our workers uh, to live in. Said well the other big input that we need for the zinc processing process is coal. Coal was the fuel that was used in the zinc plant and so the nearest coal to uh, the zinc mines in New Jersey was in the Poconos in northeastern Pennsylvania. So that is the green triangle there is uh, the Pocono Mountains. And then the customers that they were taking this zinc to in the end were in places like uh, Philadelphia. So that was where we had you know, other industries that would use this zinc in producing various other products that they were making out of it. So you've got these three locations that we need to balance between. We need to find a spot that is going to maximize our profits by minimizing our transportation costs. And so you'll notice that Palmerton is located, of these three things, Palmerton is closest to the coal mines in the Poconos. And that's because coal is bulky and it's heavy and you need a lot of it to process zinc. And so the transportation costs for that coal are much higher than the transportation costs of the zinc ore. Now you need a lot more coal per uh, unit of zinc ore. And uh, I forget the exact ratio that's there, but you need a lot more coal than you need zinc ore uh, to 
process that zinc ore. And so they decided it was mo most efficient to locate the factory closer to the coal supply. And it's in fact not only closer, but it's actually just downriver. The Lehigh uh, River comes down out of the Poconos uh, right past Palmerton. Uh, and they would send the coal barges down there, so that made it a lot easier. And then they had a railroad going across to New Jersey with the uh, zinc ore. So the location of this uh, factory was pulled towards the input with the higher transportation cost, away from the import with the lower transportation cost, also away from the customers. Because once the zinc is processed and refined, you know, that zinc ore is mostly non-zinc stuff. That's why you have to process and refine it. And so once you will get rid of all the stuff that's not zinc and you're, you're down to just the refined zinc, that is way lighter, way easier and cheaper to transport. And so it, again, made sense to be closer to the coal that's very costly to transport. And then you can make up that by... Uh, this cheaper transport of the finished zinc to places like Philadelphia or uh, the New York City area uh, where it would actually be used by the customers. So it's an illustration of the way that the transportation costs uh, create this, this balance that determines the location of this industrial activity. Okay, so now we're moving on to talk about the Kristaller model, developed by Walter Kristaller, uh, another German. A lot of these early uh, early economic geographers were Germans. And so Kristaller was looking at the locations of these market centers serving the hinterlands around them. So, you know, von Thunen, for example, started with the location of the market center as kind of a, a given. And he said, we... we take for granted that we have this market center here, and then we look at how economic activities are arranged in these rings around that. Chris Dollar said, well, wh how are these market centers going to be located? Right? Why are we going to get a market center at this spot and not some other spot? So they said, we can start out with the idea that each market center is going to serve a roughly circular hinterland around it, because people are going to go to the closest market center that they can uh, go to. And so then if you start to get multiple of these, and you can imagine the size of that circle represents kind of the distance a person is willing to realistically travel to get to a market center. Right? If, if, if it was anybody outside that circle, that market center is too far away for them to practically uh, travel to. So they need to either you know, find or create another market center somewhere else or just not live there at all, uh, if for some reason that's impossible. So we could imagine stacking these uh, market centers with their hinterlands in kind of a grid like this. But you'll notice that with this grid of these circles, we've got big gaps in between them. And we've got these big, uh, big empty spaces in between our market centers. So that either means those are going to be areas where nobody could live, or we're going to have to push our market centers much closer together so that these circles take up that uh, take up that space. And then you end up with a lot of overlap in these circles. You have a lot of people that are real close to two different market centers, which is kind of an inefficient use of space. But instead, if we arrange these in a hexagonal type of pattern, you can see that we can pack these market centers and their hinterlands a lot closer together with much less either empty space that has no market center within practical distance of it and much less overlap between them. And there's little bits of overlap and little empty spaces here in this more hexagonal arrangement, but it's a lot less than in the grid. And so we can then you know, turn this into a fully hexagonal pattern. And so this is something that Chris Dollar, again, looking at places like the, the plains in northern Germany that are close-ish uh, as real world things go to this isotropic plane, uh, where everything, all the land is the same everywhere. Uh, he saw that, in fact, cities were arranged in this kind of hexagonal pattern that if you look at the locations of towns, they make these uh, kind of this kind of hexagonal uh, system. 
And the locations of these towns were not planned by anybody. You know, nobody came along and said, well, this is where they should go to uh, maximize efficiency. They just kind of arose that way uh, through people going towards the closest market center or setting up a new market center if they uh, were too far away from any of the other ones. Now we actually see a more grid type pattern in a place like the uh, Midwest and Great Plains of the United States. We actually get more of a, the, the grid pattern, which, you know, as we saw is kind of an inefficient pattern. The reason for that is that settlement of the West in the United States was planned. The uh, federal government of the United States oversaw that uh, through things like the Homestead Act, where they gave out parcels of land to people in order to encourage uh, white settlement into those areas once they had been um, you know, acquired by the U.S. government and the native people had been pushed out of them uh, and then they were uh, bringing white settlers. So it was a centrally planned process and for the U.S. government a rectangular grid was an easier uh, geometry to work with than hexagons. And so they uh, allocated the land out west in a grid pattern rather than a hexagonal uh, pattern because it was being centrally planned. Um, but this, the idea of the Crystaller model is that these hexagons will kind of grow up on their own if you just kind of let the market run. And you don't have a, a central planner, but it will find this efficient arrangement sort of on its own. And so this theory uh, is sometimes known as the central place theory because the arrangements of these central places, right? these, these market centers serving each of these uh, hinterlands. So now I've said that this model was ba developed based on looking at places like northern Germany where the arrangement of these towns was not planned by anybody. There was nobody uh, overseeing it. It just kind of grew up through the interactions of all these, you know, little German farmers over uh, many centuries of uh, deciding where to go. However, Walter Christaller was employed by the Nazi party. You notice uh, his dates there overlap uh, the Nazi period in Germany. And he was actually hired by the Nazis to plan how they were going to settle the areas of Eastern Europe that they were expecting to conquer during World War II. So if you remember your history, one of the stated justifications for the uh, the war launched by uh, Germany was that they needed more land for the German people. And so they were going to go conquer it and take it away from the people that had it. And so they were going to expand uh, in particular into Eastern Europe, right? Into uh, what's now Poland, Czech, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, all those kind of areas, right? They were going to take that over and they were going to, you know, get rid of the people that were living there and they were going to move Germans into those areas. So just like the US federal government was moving white settlers into the West, the Nazis were moving German settlers into uh, the East. And so they hired Christaller to help them plan that because they wanted to do it in the most efficient and rational way. So this theory that is supposed to be about how the central places sort of arise without any central planning then became a template for central planning uh, that the, the Nazis were carrying out. And they, of course, didn't get to uh, implement this plan because they lost the war. Um, but this uh, kind of illustrates the way that these uh, economic models may, they may look like just kind of, uh, you know, apolitical descriptions of what happens in reality, but they can get used in a political fashion depending on uh, who uh, sees them as convenient for their political agenda. So the last theory that I want to talk about in this lesson is the idea of the urban hierarchy. So if we look at those hexagons that uh, we got in Chris Dollar's model as I described it, all those hexagons are the same. And you've got all these market centers serve, each serving their own little hinterland arranged in this nice hexagonal pattern. That's kind of the first, uh, the first step of central place theory. Because the next step is to 
note that for different sorts of activities, you need a different sized hinterland. So that hinterland is going to be a different size for different sorts of activities. A thing that you need to do all the time is going to have a smaller hinterland because you're not going to be willing to go as far for that. Something that you need less often is going to have a bigger hinterland because on the one hand, you're willing to travel farther for this thing because you don't do it as often. And then because people don't do it as often, you need a bigger hinterland to have enough people to support this activity going on. And so we can create this hierarchy where some of these population centers are not just serving their own immediate hinterland, they're also serving the hinterlands of everybody around them for certain activities that require this broader hinterland. And so to illustrate that, we can look at the urban hierarchy in Western Pennsylvania. So we might start with an activity like a gas station. So that's a thing that people have to do all the time. Uh, you have to get gas fairly frequently, and it's going to depend on how often you uh, and how much you drive and the fuel efficiency of your car, et cetera, et cetera. But, it, you know, it's a thing that people do pretty frequently, right? Most people, uh, if they're driving a decent amount, are going to get gas at least once a week, sometimes multiple times a week. So a gas station is something that you want to have close to you. A gas station is going to have a relatively small hinterland. If we're looking at, you know, we're set aside things like people doing long distance drives on highways that are stopping at gas stations. If you're just looking at the local population that's going to their nearest gas station, you can support a gas station with a fairly small hinterland to it. So there's gas, several gas stations in the town of Slippery Rock. And then you go over to Harrisville. There are gas stations there, right? There are even gas stations of the same brand, right? There's a Sheets in Slippery Rock, there's a Sheets in Harrisville, because there's enough people in the area, you know, if you uh, take everybody between Slippery Rock and halfway out to Harrisville and kind of make a circle like that, there's enough people within that circle to support the Slippery Rock Sheets. And the same thing, if you draw a circle around Harrisville that extends halfway to Slippery Rock, there's enough people in that hinterland to support the Harrisville Sheets. Okay, so gas stations are a economic activity that's going to happen at that lowest level of the urban hierarchy, that they're going to be uh, serving a very immediate kind of hinterland around them because they're a thing people do very often and so therefore aren't willing to go very far for. But then if we move up the urban hierarchy, we see an activity like a movie theater. So most people don't uh, spend as much money at movie theaters as they spend at gas stations. You don't go to movie theaters as often as you go to a gas station. Obviously thinking of you know, non-pandemic uh, times here. Uh, aside from so like really hardcore movie buffs, most people don't go to movie theater that often. So you would not be able to support a full-fledged movie theater with like the full run of uh, movies in Slippery Rock from just that same hinterland that comes to the Slippery Rock Sheets, right? Just the people within that same range that are enough to keep the Slippery Rock Sheets in business, that's not enough people to keep a movie theater in business because those people don't see enough movies. Movie, movie going is a rare enough activity. You can't support it on just the people immediately around Slippery Rock. You certainly couldn't support a movie theater in Harrisville from just the people in the immediate vicinity of Harrisville that uh, you know, all get their gas at the Harrisville Sheets. So instead, what you have is you have a movie theater in a place like Butler. And so that movie theater serves not only the people within the immediate surroundings of Butler, right? the people that would go to the sheets in Butler, uh, but also serves the people in the areas around Butler that have their own, uh, their own central places for those lower level activities. So the people in Slippery Rock and Harrisville will go to Butler to see a movie. So Butler becomes a higher level urban center. It absorbs the hinterlands of places around it like Slippery Rock, Harrisville, Zelianople, Conoquenessing, you know, all the other towns that you can name around the area. Uh, Butler absorbs all them into its higher into its hinterland for these higher level activities like movie theaters that require this larger hinterland. But even Butler in that expanded hinterland is not enough to support certain other activities that people use even more rarely than that. So that includes things like a commercial airport. So I know there's an airport in Butler, but you're not going to like, you know, get flights from Butler to, you know, San Diego or 
Chicago or wherever, right? Uh, for for doing uh, that kind of, you know, just buying a ticket on an airplane to, to go somewhere on the other side of the country, you got to go all the way to Pittsburgh. And so Pittsburgh has an airport. Pittsburgh also has movie theaters. Pittsburgh has gas stations, right? And so the gas stations in Pittsburgh serve a very immediate kind of area. The movie theaters serve a broader area. So uh, people would come to a Pittsburgh movie theater from farther out. And then the airport in Pittsburgh serves an even broader area. Okay? So people in Slippery Rock and Harrisville will go all the way down to Pittsburgh uh, for the airport, as will people from Butler, and as will people coming from other directions as well. As right? so that the hinterland of Pittsburgh uh, for the airport will extend out in other directions. So it goes extends out to you know places like um, Greensboro and stuff in the east, and extends south to like Washington and uh, you know and all the other uh, directions. So different activities depending on uh, how often people do them, how much money people spend on them, and therefore how many people they need to remain viable will be at different levels of this urban hierarchy and will require a different sized hinterland. And so the locations that have these higher level activities on them will become these bigger uh, centers within this urban hierarchy. And so this is a simplified urban hierarchy, right? There are places kind of in between here, and then you can go up above Pittsburgh. There are things you can't even do in Pittsburgh that you would have to go to, you know, New York City or Washington or Chicago or something uh, for, and you get all the way up to what we call uh, global cities right? that are kind of the top of the global urban hierarchy, which would, again, be places like New York City or, or London uh, that have some uh, activities that serve hinterlands that uh, span the entire world as compared to these lowest level centers like Harrisville that have amenities like a gas station and a post office for just the very immediate uh, surroundings. So those are some of these uh, classical models in economic geography. So we are going to spend the rest of this unit seeing how some of these models play out. And then I will see you for another lecture in a few weeks.